Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, John Rees. Pope Francis recently invited Israeli President Shimon Peres and his Palestinian counterpart Mahmoud Abbas to the Vatican for an evening of prayer, but stressed that he was not seeking to get involved in the peace negotiations. Peace talks collapsed back in April after the Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas agreed to a reconciliation agreement with rival Palestinian organization Hamas. The Israeli government blamed Abbas for the collapse and warned him to choose between either peace with Hamas or peace with Israel. U.S. Foreign Secretary John Kerry telephoned Abbas to express his disappointment, but then shortly after angered Israel by warning that without a two-state solution, Israel could become an apartheid state. Kerry then later retracted the use of the word, but Israel's supporters in the U.S. Congress were furious. The new Palestinian government was sworn in last week in Ramallah, and it's to be led by Prime Minister Rami Hamdallah. Uh, Hamdallah's cabinet will be formed of 16 other ministers, four of whom are from the Gaza Strip, and these people were denied a right to travel to the ceremony by Israel. Well, the European Union's position is that Palestinian uni uh, unity government should be supported, but Israel has actively sought to undermine it. So what can we expect from the unified government? And could a united Palestinian government help advance peace? Let's take a look at this report. After seven years of division, the cycle of bloodshed and conflict between Palestine's rival factions has ended, at least for the moment. In a landmark deal last week, Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas announced a joint government of national unity between the Fatah-controlled West Bank and the Hamas-controlled Gaza Strip. This government will initially be comprised of 16 technocratic ministers, with fresh elections to be held in the next six months. President Abbas, however, struck a cautious note, stating that this is only the first step in a process that has seen many false starts. The importance of this government is that we ended the division and we will continue in our path to have national reconciliation. This is the most important step. It was the hardest mission, but we got through it. For the Palestinian people in both territories, there were mixed opinions about the deal. Many want the unity government to succeed, but many have also seen how easily such settlements can fall apart. I am so happy. Thank God. The most important thing is that we are united. We are Muslims and Palestinians. We don't want Fatah and Hamas. This is a temporary government for the next six months. We are afraid that we will return back to the time before the unity, that they will form the government and then they will say it won't work out. With the unity deal signed, in Gaza, government offices that have been run for several years by the Islamist Hamas were handed over to new ministers in the technocratic government. While deep disagreements between Fatah and Hamas remain, President Abbas has called for the Palestinian Election Committee to begin election preparations, with the aim of a more permanent unity administration to be formed after that mandate. These moves have been strongly condemned by Israel, which categorically refuses to negotiate with Hamas due to its connections to terrorist groups and its policy to destroy the state of Israel. With the deal between the two sides all but closed, Israel refused to allow newly appointed ministers from Gaza to travel to the West Bank to be sworn in. The Israeli government has already broken off the US-led peace talks with President Abbas's Fatah government, following the initial announcement of a unity deal. And on Thursday, it announced the resumption of building settlements in the West Bank, with a further 1,500 promised by the Israeli housing minister. In a plea to the international community, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu asked them not to recognize what he sees as the government which includes terrorists. I call on all the responsible elements in the international community not to hurry and recognize a Palestinian government which includes Hamas or leaning on Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization which calls for the destruction of Israel and the international community must not embrace it. But the international community has so far largely offered its tentative support to a unity government, with Turkey, China and the United Nations all stating their recognition of the unity government. And much to the Israeli government's disappointment, America has stated that it will work with the new government and continue to offer aid support, but will continue to monitor its policies and performance in the future. Moving forward, we will be judging this government by its actions. Uh, based on what we know now, we intend to work with this government, but we'll be watching closely to ensure that it upholds the principles that President Abbas reiterated today. President Abbas has now managed to complete the difficult task of uniting the two conflicting authorities in Palestine together. But the more difficult task ahead of him, and for his ministers, is to convince the world, Israel and the people of Palestine that this is an agreement that can provide a credible government for the state of Palestine. Nathaniel Amos Sanson, Islam Channel. 
Well, joining me in the discussion are Paul Yuziskin, who's a London-based writer on the Middle East, and Martin Linton, former MP and the director of Labour to Palestine, a not-for-profit organisation that aims to increase the understanding about Palestine in the British Labour Party. And joining us on the line are Dr Mostafa Baghouti, who is Secretary General of the Palestinian National Initiative, and Dr Ahmed Youssef, a former political advisor to ex-Prime Minister Ismail Haniya. Welcome to you all. Um, Martin, um, will this deal stick? Will the United Palestinian Authority survive? Well, they've done very well so far. Uh, they, they've had a couple of go goes previously, uh, signed agreements to uh, reconcile, I think, in Cairo and in Doha, uh, and both of those collapsed after a few weeks. This one has gone is going the distance. Uh, they've they've done some of the difficult small things that they need to do. You can now read a West Bank newspaper in Gaza. Um, which have been banned for, for goodness knows how long, and they've agreed to not to imprison one, one another's members. So uh, they are serious this time, and the, the, the government is there. Of course, uh, the whole object of the exercise is to actually have the election, because no, no politician uh, that we've seen on, on the screen there has a mandate. All of their mandates have elapsed. They were elected in... 2006 or 2005, uh, so they should have they should have given up 2009, 2010. They're still there. They don't have a mandate. Uh, it's essential that they should have an election, and that uh, that government that is elected, hopefully in January of 2015, will be a government with a fresh mandate, able to negotiate. Uh, and I think the, the the mere fact that they have a new government and that the, the uh, they, they now have the, the support, uh, well, not the, the Americans and all the European countries are, are ha happy to deal with this government, gives a better chance of a um, serious stab at a, a peace agreement than we've had for a long time. Mm. Let me bring in uh, Dr Mustafa Barghouti. Dr Barghouti, uh, do you think that's right? Do you think that um, this will last and it will last until an election which can have a government that's got more legitimacy than this has? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? I'm saying, do you think that this um, uh, that this unity government will last, and will it get to a set of elections that can give um, the Palestinian government more legitimacy than it's had recently? Well, it, uh, there is the, the chances of this government succeeding and lasting is much bigger than any time before, uh, for several reasons. Uh, I think the first reason is that the parties that are involved in the deal. Uh, do realize that their alternatives are much worse than having this unity. Second, I think the reception of this uh, government has been uh, has been good uh, in almost everywhere in the world, with the exception of Israel, of course. And the Israeli position in this regard is quite isolated. Uh, these are the good things. But uh, the challenges are in the fact that this government is uh, practically going to be overwhelmed with so many things it has it has to to deal with. Uh, the most recent crisis in Gaza about people's salaries is uh, is one one example of these problems. Uh, second, I think uh, the path uh, forward will be full of Israeli obstacles. Uh, which requires very determined uh, intention from the side of both Fatah and Hamas to keep this unity so that they can overcome the frequent Israeli obstacles. OK, let me put that to Paul Yuskin here in the studio. Paul, um, you know, all right, Martin and Mustafa both said this is a better shot than previous ones, but the phrase technocratic government and overwhelming problems, uh, is that a, a pairing likely to survive? I think as we go forward from where we are at the moment, we're going to find increased international support for this government, despite the minefields that it faces. And along that way, um, you're going to see Israel more and more isolated. The best that Israel can come up with at the moment, at least according to the latest readings of the media that I saw today, is an insistence that the PA take control of security of Gaza. Well, you can't actually make the demand of that to the, to the new reconciliation government, as it's called, whilst at the same time saying, we're not going to talk to you and we're going to cut off your funding, etc., etc., etc. 
So we have to look at what the long game is. Mm. And the long game really now, I think, is less and less a test of Israel saying no, and more and more a test of what the international community will actually be able to do if Israel starts taking annexationist uh, steps on the ground. That's the big test, because long term, it seems to me that what the Palestinian reconciliation government is aimed at is to get to the United Nations and request from the United Nations official recognition at which point Israel doesn't have a controlling hand on the outcome anymore. But this is a test. And I think more than for the Palestinian reconciliation government, it's a test for the outside world. There is one other country that hasn't supported this, and that's Australia. Yeah. But apart from them, it seems that everybody is slowly and surely lining up. A very close Palestinian observer friend of mine said recently he changed his mind about whether it was worth taking the steps towards the UN because he felt that everything would depend upon who would get the blame for the failure of the Kerry talks. If it was Israel, then there was a chance. If it was Mahmoud Abbas, then you wouldn't get there. The Western world wouldn't go for it. Mm. Here, here is where we are. Mm. Mahmoud Abbas is not the person who is the responsible one for failure of the talks. OK. Uh, Dr. Youssef, um, do you think, uh, and this wouldn't be the first time this has happened, that um, if uh, the Israeli government can't disrupt this process um, by talk or by relying on its traditional allies, that uh, a new kind of annexationist burst will, will do the business? Actually, if I uh, understood your question, because uh, the voice is, is not uh, clear to me here in Gaza, but the Israelis, they are from the day one. They, uh, they threaten that they are not going to this government to take off. They try now to make it difficult for anybody from Ramallah to come to Gaza or anybody from the ministers who have been elect selected to travel to Ramallah. So it's a big dilemma now. We can't handle the salary uh, problem until now because there is no... Uh, yani, uh, the Israeli is not allowing for those people who suppose to come to Gaza to address the issue of the committees who will, uh, will handle the, the problems of how we can uh, restore uh, uh, yani, these ministers, uh, ministers, ministers in, in West Bank and Gaza and restructuring it in the way to make the government succeed. So this is what, what one of the problems, big problems and big obstacles that the Israeli try to prevent the minister to travel either from Ramallah or to Ramallah from Gaza. So this is one of the major problems and until now the world community is not doing anything and we are we're still waiting with, okay. with the, the, the trouble that we are facing on how to pay the salaries of the employees of uh, the government of Ramallah and the government in, in Gaza. It's a big dilemma now. We, we don't know. It's, the situation is total quandary right now. OK, well, let me take that, Martin. So, I mean, is, what, is one aspect of this or one consequence of this going to be that the siege of Gaza is uh, at least partially lifted? I think I think it will be yes. Uh, it's implicit. I mean, uh, but that will only ha really happen if the uh, if the elections go ahead in the beginning of next year. I think one of the key issues now uh, is to uh, persuade the Israelis to allow the elections to go ahead. It, it's strange the Israelis always make a big point of saying how they're a democratic country. One, one could question that, but they, they, they pride themselves on their democracy. Yet when the Palestinians try to have an election, they do everything they can to stop it. Netanyahu has actually already said on a television interview that he would not allow Palestinians living in East Jerusalem to vote in a Palestinian election. And it's also known fact that he jails many Hamas MPs, and he might well jail Hamas candidates in an election. And you know, he, uh, um, he, he will do everything he can to stop the, that election taking place. Therefore, the key issue now is that Western countries, particularly the UK, France, Germany, etc., should do everything they can, put pressure on Israel to allow the elections to take place and to allow the uh, to persuade the Israelis that they must stand back. They must allow people travel, to travel from Gaza to the West Bank. You can't have an election in two isolated countries. Uh, you must not arrest or imprison anybody who's a candidate. And you must allow Palestinians, including the Palestinians in Jerusalem, to vote. Mm.
Paul, uh, this isn't the first time that the, the Israelis have, have found themselves in a position which they were, where they were deeply unhappy um, with developments actually in, in the United States. I mean, the, the whole um, farrago over the uh, attack on, uh, on Iran, for instance, put them in a similar position. Are, are we looking at an Israeli state which is perhaps historically uniquely diplomatically isolated now? Um, no, I don't think it's a fair description of Israel being isolated, really, up until this current period. Uh, and I think that the term isolation, as interpreted by Mr. Netanyahu and his followers, is actually grist to the mill. In other words, I am the man who will stand up to all the outside pressures and I will do whatever I want to do and prove that we are just as tough as we always were and we're not really dependent upon anybody. So if I say they won't be allowed to participate in elections from Gaza, then they won't. If I say I want the PA to take control of security in Gaza, they'd better. Look at me. I'm the strong guy. The problem with all of this is that it comes at a time where, as usual with Israeli foreign policy, it's dictated by internal foreign policy, internal policy rather, and there are clear signs of creaking at the joints within the Israeli politics, within the current cabinet, mm. um, shifting in directions which I don't think Netanyahu wants, but I'm not sure he can stop. Okay. Um Dr. Parkuti, is that how you see it, that the, the, the current developments make Israel perhaps more isolated than it's been in the past, and there are some fractures inside um, the Israeli state as a result of that? Uh, Dr. Parkuti, can you hear me? Okay. Um, let, let me, Dr. Youssef, if you're there, let me put that question to you. Do you think that Israel is, is uh, so isolated now that there are cracks beginning to appear inside the regime? Sorry, again, I, I can't hear you, sorry. Uh, do you think that Israel is so isolated now that uh, there are cracks beginning to appear within the regime? I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I, I can't hear you. OK, let me sorry. leave that there. We'll, we'll have to leave the links for the moment. Um, Martin, address yourself to that. Is that, is that how you, I mean, Paul's made a, a persuasive case. Do you, do you see it that way? Well, I think certainly Israel is isolated, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure Netanyahu will uh, will see that as a, a challenge uh, uh, played to his advantage. But the important point, I think, is not that is Israel is isolated. It's, Israel has always used Hamas in the past as an excuse for not really getting engaged in the peace process. And uh, the reconciliation between Hamas and Fatah has basically shot his fox, uh, the, shot the Israelis' fox, so that they've got no no easy person to blame. I mean, you said in, your, in the introduction that the talks failed on the issue of the unity government. Not in fact, they failed on the issue of the settlements. Mm. It's true the Israelis tried to blame the unity government, um, but uh, nobody else would, 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 would buy that, really. Um, it, it was the persistent uh, announcements of new settlement building that, that put pay to, to the peace talks, and will put pay to them in the future if it happened again. But the situation that has now um, arisen is that, that for the first uh, just, time... Just let me ask you, uh, yeah. and is that the issue that the Israelis might use to blow apart something that they're unable to stop by other means? Well, the settlements? Yeah. Uh, well, they might. I mean, they, they, they're, they're always using settlements as a provocation. They were constantly announcing these... Uh, increased building of settlement units to try and provoke the Palestinians to walk out of the mm. talks. Um, but but uh, at the end of the day, uh, for the first time in the, in the history that I can remember, you know, it always used to be um, the Americans and the Israelis on one side, just about everybody else on the other mm. side. For the first time, it's just Israel by themselves on one side and the Americans keeping fairly quiet and not making uh, accusations against the Israelis, but encouraging the Europeans to put pressure on the, on the Israelis. And that changes the whole chemistry of the situation. And I think is, we are beginning to see the crumbling of the, of the old order here. And uh, quite how soon it will, uh, it will work through the system, I don't know. But Europe has the possibility. I mean, Europe is Israel's biggest trading partner. Uh, and Israel is hugely dependent on trade with Europe. And Europe has the potential, in a way that America doesn't, to affect change in, in, in Israel. And if European countries, particularly the UK, choose to use that power they have in a very diplomatic way, but make it clear to the Israelis that 
if they don't allow the elections to take place, if they don't, uh, if they don't move towards a, a peace agreement with, with, you know, with the Palestinians, that they will take effectively sanctions, again, first against settlement trade, and if that doesn't work, more, more generally against Israel. That is what will persuade the Israelis. It needs to be done in a diplomatic, respectful way, but I think it, the, the ball is now in the European court. The Europeans could bring about change. OK. Well, we'll come back to that question of the international dimension in the second half of the programme. But just before this part ends, Paul, um, who is going to gain most in terms of the Palestinians out of the unity government? Will it be the case that uh, Fatah predominate over Hamas? After all, it was their moderation that, in a way, produced Hamas in the first place. Or, or, or what will happen? It's very hard to say at the moment, to be very honest. Hamas clearly has come to this position uh, as a result of weakness. It doesn't have the support that it had in Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood, which is its power base, if you like, has gone. Um, it is not, as, as a power base across the region, not as effective as it used to be. They are isolated. So they had to come to some kind of deal where there wasn't the same rationale before. Whether that works and how that works in an election in the West Bank and Gaza is extremely difficult to tell, putting aside just for a moment what Israel may or may not do to interfere with those elections. Let's not forget whether they were working on behalf of Israel or for their own benefit, the PA has clamped down on Hamas in the West Bank. They have to go through some form of regeneration to convince the electorate that that isn't going to happen when an election comes. Um, it's, it's, very, it's a very difficult one to untangle. OK. Well, thanks for, thanks for giving it a go. And we'll be looking at some of the broader international dimensions that have been affecting the uh, Palestinian reconciliation and the Israeli reaction to it in the second half of the programme. So do rejoin us after the break.